Number three, evaluating dispensationalism. I'd like to begin by looking at a little chart that we had from our last time together about biblical frameworks. And uh, Jerry had put this together. I thought it was so nice. So I just wanted to show it to you as well. Today, we're on the left side. That's our focus, dispensationalism. You have classic dispensationalism, revised dispensationalism, progressive dispensationalism, and there's also something else called ultra-dispensationalism uh, that was the result of E.W. Bullinger. So there's really even another branch in addition. But then on the right side, you have progressive covenantalism, covenant theology, and Christian reconstructionism, and those are what we call covenantalism. So today, right now, with me, we're on the yellow side, the left side here, the dispensational side. And then next time, we'll talk about covenant theology. Jerry's going to lead us through that and explain what covenant theology is. Now, there are a lot of varieties, and so if you... If your version of dispensationalism doesn't line up exactly with the version that I'm explaining, it's, I'm not trying to be difficult. It's just that there are so many different varieties of it, and I'm, I'm going to try to talk about it in more or less an inclusive way, but then also go through different stages of it. And I, I want to focus on the problems with dispensationalism and why I don't believe in dispensationalism is the best system. But before I do that... Jerry said I had to say something nice. And so I want to cover the benefits of dispensationalism because there wouldn't be millions of Christians with this biblical framework if it didn't have benefits, right? And so I want to look at the benefits. I've got about seven benefits. Maybe you can add a couple more to that list. And then I've got five problems with dispensationalism that I want to cover. All right, so here are the benefits. Number one, it's a clean logical system. I love that. I like clean, simple. You can draw it out on a piece of paper, on a napkin at a restaurant. You could draw out the seven dispensations and explain the whole system to somebody, and it makes sense. Number two, it recognizes stages in the history of redemption. Last time I mentioned, or yeah, a couple times ago, I mentioned about a flat biblical framework, where you just read everything as if it's equally relevant to everyone at all time, as if the Bible just dropped out of the sky complete. But that's not how the Bible developed. The Bible developed over centuries by all these different people in different situations, and there was a development that happened as God unraveled his plan of redemption. And dispensationalism recognizes that there are stages to that development, and I think that's, I think that's good. Number three is it honors Israel. Dispensationalism has been credited with a lot of pro-Israel activity, especially in the 20th century, second half in, in particular. Um, and that eliminates anti-Semitism. Christianity has had a really hard time at certain periods of our history with our treatment of the Jews. You know, we had the Crusades. We had all kinds of other bad things that happened. The Inquisition in Spain, for example, where somebody was forcibly converted to Christianity. And then if they were later found practicing Judaism in secret, they would be tortured. You know, that kind of behavior happened out of a certain framework of Christian thought in that period. And with dispensationalism, they recognize that God has a covenant with Israel that is current today, and God has a separate covenant that is current with the church today, and that you don't, mess, you don't mess with Israel, and Israel shouldn't mess with the church, and everybody should respect each other. And that's, that's a good you know, end result, even if I might disagree with the, um, the reasoning for it, the result is certainly good. Number four, it teaches vigilance, since Christ could return to rapture the church at any moment. You have this idea in dispensationalism. Now, you don't have to believe in a pre-tribulation rapture as a dispensationalist, but the overwhelming majority of dispensationalists also do believe that Jesus can come back at any moment. And so the end result of that, the benefit of that, is that people have to take their faith seriously because you don't know. What if it were today? 
Number five, it takes Old Testament prophecy seriously. It doesn't just sweep it under the rug or say, oh, that was for the Jews and it's irrelevant for my understanding of Scripture as a whole. No, the dispensationalist says, no, let's really get, let's drill down to the most minute details of, for example, Daniel chapter 9 and really parse that last, those last couple of verses there to get that 70th week and, and tie that into Revelation. And you can see how they're just working those prophecies together, taking them very seriously, which I think is it's good to take prophecy seriously. I think it's good to take all the Bible seriously. Uh, number six, dispensationalism has the benefit of a literal instead of allegorical interpretation. There was a whole period of church history. Uh, starting in the second century, though, it wasn't as popular until the third and the fourth century in, in those um, early Middle Ages, where most Christians interpreted the Bible allegorically. And they said, oh, this represents that. And when it says this, what it really means is that over here. And dispensationalism has no truck with that. Dispensationalism says it says what it means, and it means what it says, and it's just as simple as that. And so I, I think that's, that's to be commended. And then last of all, dispensationalism avoids legalism. If you're a dispensationalist you're not, and, and you're a Gentile, you're not thinking, oh, I should, I should keep the law uh, that God made with Israel. You're thinking, no, God made that law with Israel, and that's... Um, one thing that's happening, and God made this other covenant with us as Gentile Christians, and so these are two separate things, and so the dispensationalist, you won't find a dispensationalist who's trying to keep the law like you will in some of these other systems that we're, we're looking at, uh, especially to the point of legalism as we see it in Scripture. So those are some benefits of dispensationalism. Uh, wanted to just cover those first before I get into some of the problems with dispensationalism. Like I mentioned, I have five problems that I want to cover with you. I can't be super in-depth with each one, but I can at least mention them and then give you a couple of verses. And when I give a verse, you can look it up in your Bible if you want, but I'm also going to have it on screen for the, for the people that are watching at home. So the first thing up is that the time periods are arbitrary, overlapping, and, and artificial. I think this is a problem with dispensationalism. Time periods, what time periods, Sean? Well, here are, there are many different systems within dispensationalism where they count out four, seven, even eight or more uh, time periods or dispensations or another term is administrations, okay? So on the left side, we have kind of a classic formulation here where you, where you start out with the period of paradise, that would be the Garden of Eden. And then the period of the patriarchs is a new administration or dispensation. Then you have the period of the law. And then Christ gets his own dispensation. He's, he's sort of by himself. He's, he's after the law and he's before the church. And he's in that uh, dispensation of Christ. Then you have the church or grace. And then after Jesus comes back, you have the appearing or revelation dispensation. And this is the period during which the events recorded in the book of Revelation will unfold. And um, then finally, we end up back in paradise or glory, depending on the terminology there. What I like about this system is that it recognizes that what God wanted in the beginning, he gets in the end. I think that's great, because I see that in the Bible. I don't think that's disputable or controversial. What we see in Genesis, the first two chapters, we see in Revelation. There are differences, but the similarities are striking. Uh, so I think that's pretty good. But at the same time, there are also problems here, okay? When God establishes the law, for example, that law affects Christ as well because Christ is a Jew under the law. So how are you going to have a barrier, a wall, between the law and Christ when Christ kept the law? And dispensationalists, if you really want to think about it, believe that Jews today should keep the law. So that means that that law is actually overlapping right into the, uh, the church age as well. That that law is not just a defined period of time, but no, something that still affects us, uh, or at least Jewish people, to this very day. Uh, and then over here on this more progressive side of the fence of dispensation, a little more modern take on it, you have a different way of calculating out these periods. You have innocence, conscience, 
human government, promise, law, grace, and kingdom. And what we really see here is the turning points in the, in the periods are when God makes covenants. So the conscience period ends with Noah when God makes his covenant with Noah. And that comes to an end when God makes his covenant with Abraham. And then that comes to an end when God makes his covenant with Israel. And that comes to an end when God makes his covenant with the church. Right? And so you can see that the dispensations on the progressive side, the more modern side of this system, coincide very nicely with the covenants in Scripture. Whereas on the left side, the older form of dispensationalism, they're really independent from the covenants. Um, so this is, this is, I think, problematic for us because, uh, well, take, take the church age today, right? Let's say you're a Gentile living in the church age and you're a dispensationalist. So you think you, uh, in order to be part of God's people, you just have to have faith in the gospel message, right? Now, let's say you have a Jewish friend and your Jewish friend says to you, am I okay just being a Jew, following the law that God gave to our fathers. As a dispensationalist, you'd have to say, yes, you're okay, but what we have is better because you will get a better inheritance in the end if you come to the church. And so then the Jewish person says, all right, all right, I'm listening. So what's the difference? Well, we don't have to keep the law and we get a better inheritance. Sounds good, <laughs> right? So, like, how does that even make sense? So, now, now let's say you're a Jewish believer. Where do you fit into the system? This is where you get into these issues of overlapping um, between the two. And let's say you were born before the administration of grace. Let's say you were born somewhere, somewhere around here, somewhere in that law period, whichever system you look at, you would be so lucky to be a Jew, right? Because if you were born as an Israelite, then you had access to the covenant. And if you were born as a Gentile, you would be separated from the covenant. You would be separated from the dispensation of the law because you wouldn't know anything about it. And then if you're born in the church age as an Israelite, you have a disadvantage, <laughs> right? So there, there are these, these inherent problems with thinking about the system in this kind of way that really leads me to my third point on this, which is, it's arbitrary, and I can, I can prove to you it's arbitrary because dispensationalists disagree among themselves about which divisions work, which divisions are right. That tells you that it's arbitrary. Second of all, that they're overlapping. Look, if you are somebody who is, say, in the human government period, right, and you're not from, an, uh, from a descendant of Abraham, you're not a genetic descendant of Abraham, guess what? You're still in the human government period today if you're not a Christian, right? These things all overlap. It's not, there's no way to divide this up evenly and say that everyone in our world today is in the church. That, 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 does, that doesn't work. And, and so the system really struggles with that. And then last of all is that it's artificial, in other words, there's no verse in the Bible that lists out these seven things. There's no clear um, explanation of how God works differently in these different periods of time. And that's why there's so much disagreement among dispensationalists themselves. All right, let's move on to point number two, which is that dispensationalism separates Christ's followers from his words. Now, this doesn't apply to all forms of dispensationalism, but it does apply to classic dispensationalism and revised dispensationalism. And just because I'm saying it's classic and revised, in other words, these are the older forms, doesn't mean that they're not still around today and people don't still believe in them today. There are plenty of people that still believe in the 19th century version of dispensationalism, also known as classic. Um, and they do not believe, uh, let's go back to this other list here. You can see here that the, um, the period of Christ there is separated from the period of the law, right? You see that, right? There's a division here. And then there's a division here. So if you're in the church age here, 
you don't need, you don't need the words of Christ. You're in a different dispensation. You're in a different period of time. Why do you need the words of Christ? The words of Christ were for his own administration, just like the words of Moses were for his administration. The words of Christ are for the church administration. So this, uh, this right here, this division between Christ and the church, I think is a real problem for the system. In light of the fact that Jesus said, now why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Do we not want to call Jesus Lord? Of course we want to call Jesus Lord. We wanted to call Jesus Savior, but we also want to call Jesus Lord. Both are important to us as Christians. Savior means that he saves us, he died for us. Lord means that he's in charge and that his words are relevant for our lives. In fact, Jesus says that not everyone who says to me, Matthew 7, 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Look, Jesus has already said that on the last day, he's about to say this, on the last day, on the judgment day, people are going to come up to him and say to him, Lord, Lord, they're going to confess Jesus is Lord, like it says in Romans 10, 9. And Jesus is going to say to them, I never knew you because you didn't do what I said. You didn't do the will of my Father. That's scary. What, what should I do with these words? I know. I'll relegate them to another period of time so I don't have to listen to them. Come on. Like, we can't do that. Like, these words are about the future. They're not, about, they're not even about the past. They're about the future and about people standing before Christ. And I don't want to stand before Christ and be like, look, man, I was grace administration. Like, I didn't have to follow your words. I don't think, that, I don't think that's going to play on the last day. Jesus goes on, he says, many, not just a couple of knuckleheads, many people will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, do we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? These aren't, these aren't charlatans, these aren't fakers. It doesn't say like we, we pretended to do these things. It said they did these things. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you, leave me, you who practice Lawlessness, you who are going away from what Christ has said is right. And then last of all, here's from uh, our brother Paul himself, 1 Timothy 6, 3. If anyone advocates a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words, those of our Lord Jesus Christ, and with the doctrine conforming to godliness, he is conceited and understands nothing. <laughs> Paul, Paul wanted Timothy, this is his epistle to Timothy, Paul wanted Timothy to recognize that if anyone out there, any so-called Christian out there, advocates a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ, that person is, understands nothing and has a sick craving for controversial questions and disputes about words from which come envy, strife, abusive language, evil suspicions. I don't know about you. I don't want to be in that category. <laughs> I want to agree with the wholesome words of Christ. And Paul himself agreed with the wholesome words of Christ. And so did James. James quotes Jesus all over the place. And, and 1 John and 2 John, 3 John, the, the, the uh, epistles by John, they agree with Jesus. So this, I think, for me, when I was a dispensationalist and I changed my mind about it, this was the big thing for me personally. Now, there are some forms of dispensationalism that don't separate um, the church from the words of Christ. So to them, this would not be a relevant criticism. Okay, But the version that I and many others uh, believed in did. All right, number three, separate requirements for Israel and the church. So, as you know, Israel, ever since the days of Abraham in Genesis 17, when God gave Abraham, entered into a covenant with him, and had, it was a blood covenant through circumcision. Ever since that happened, God has commanded Abraham to have his descendants, his physical descendants, the males, to be circumcised on what day? The eighth day. Very good. And so this is something that has gone passed down generation after generation after generation. That is how you, as a male Israelite, 
enter into the covenant with God. The Abrahamic covenant with God. And then later on, when God made a covenant with Israel, he made it part of that law that you had to be circumcised. And that is how you got in. It was by birth. If, it, girls, I think, were a little luckier. They were just born into it. You know, guys, we had to have the surgery. But <laughs> everybody is, is entered into that covenant by your race, by your genealogy, by your ancestry. How, how does somebody join the church? By faith. It's totally different. Totally different. The church is made up of covenant members by faith. And this goes along with baptism being believer's baptism as opposed to infant baptism from a dispensational framework. We're going to look at covenant theology later, which the covenant theologians believe in infant baptism, whereas the dispensational framework says, no, 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 God has his covenant with Israel, and that's uh, through circumcision, and it, and it has all these uh, commandments associated with it, and then God has his covenant with the church, and it's through baptism and faith, and it's, it's, it's totally different than what God had with Israel. And so, if you're a Jewish person, you're not allowed to eat bacon. If you're a Christian person, you're allowed to eat bacon. And a dispensationalist is totally fine with that double standard. God has one standard for them and one standard for us, and that's just the way it is. However, I find this problematic because of some, some ironically, scriptures from Paul and the church epistles. Galatians 3.6 says, Just as Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness, therefore we recognize that it is those who are of faith who are sons of Abraham. Whoa! I thought it was circumcision. Something new has happened in Christ. Something new has happened in Christ. That if you are of faith, you are a child of Abraham. The scripture foreseeing God would justify the Jews. No, the Gentiles by faith. And the Jews too, but, you know, adding the Gentiles in through faith into this thing with Abraham. Not into some new thing that is, is never been heard of before, uh, a total secret, but actually this, this same blessings of Abraham. He preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham saying, all the nations will be blessed in you. So then those who are of faith, this is the same line as we just saw up here, are blessed with Abraham, the believer. Another scripture, I'm just going to read through it quickly. We'll probably come back to it later in this class. Ephesians 2.11. Therefore, remember that you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in flesh by human hands, remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the people of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in the world. Man. That's a tough spot. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were previously far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into what? Hello. In Christ, both groups have been made into one. It's not two. It's now one, according to Ephesians chapter 2. And broke down the barrier of the dividing wall. What a wonder is that dividing wall? By abolishing in his flesh the hostility, which is the law, composed of commandments expressed in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two one new humanity. The old translations say one new man. The new translations, to avoid sexism, say person. But I think humanity is, is, is like a whole new way of being a human being is what we're talking about here. This right here. In this way, establishing peace, and that he might reconcile them both in one body. See how many times he's saying the same thing? You have, you have Jews, you have Gentiles. The Jews were hooked up. They were part of God's covenant people. They had all his promises, all this awesome stuff over all these centuries. Then you had the Gentiles. They're just kind of like losers. And we have without hope and without God in this world. And this world's pretty messed up. So like being without God is really messed up. And what is he saying here? Oh, you Gentiles, you can become Jews. No, he's not saying that. And he's not saying, you Jews, why don't you all become Gentiles? That's not what he's saying either. He's saying, I'm taking these both and making one new humanity. 
one new way to relate to me, one in one body through the cross, by it having put to death the hostility. And I believe that hostility, once again, uh, refers to the law, the same hostility down here. And he came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both, see this, we both, the Jews and the Gentiles, have our access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and foreigners, you Gentiles, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the spirit. You don't have two buildings. You don't have the temple and the church. You have one building that is built up to God's glory, built on the foundation of the prophets and the apostles. So I don't, I don't see there as being two separate requirements for the people of God. And I'll underline that by just reading this last section from Galatians 3, where it says, For you are all sons and daughters of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all what? One in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants and heirs according to the promise. I mean, this text is huge for this whole subject of dispensationalism because these old distinctions that were so important in that period of time that we were, we were thinking about called the law or the covenant with Israel, depending on what system you're looking at, that whole uh, distinction has in Christ become something new where those old identity markers are, you know, faded away compared to the incredible events that Jesus has accomplished so that we could be heirs. And we're not heirs of some different promise This is the promise God made to Abraham that we as Gentiles, along with the Jews, are made heirs of. So let's move on to number four here. It separates dispensationalism, separates Israel and the church in the age to come. And so the idea for classic dispensationalism, if you're familiar with it, is that the Jews will, well, not just Jews, but Israelites, all the you know, people from Israel, the nation of Israel, and then their descendants throughout time, they would all inherit the land. They would all inherit uh, ethnic, national, territorial Israel and the earth as well. And then if you're part of the church, you go to heaven. So you had two hopes, but that's a problem for this scripture here in Ephesians 4, 4 that says there is one body, one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father who is over all and through all and in all. So we have one hope, not two hopes. And so along with this was the idea in classic dispensationalism that the kingdom of heaven was referring to the the church, that you go to heaven, and the kingdom of God was referring to the Jews, and that's where you live on the earth. But the problem with that distinction is saying the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God are two different things is this verse here, Matthew 19, 23 to 24, where it says, And Jesus said to his disciples, Truly, I say to you, it will be hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. And again, I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. So Matthew 19, 23 says, Pretty much the same thing as Matthew 19, 24, both talking about how hard it is for rich people to enter into the kingdom. And in the first place, it just says it's hard for a rich person. In the second place, it says it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle, right? So it's saying the same thing twice using different words. The second verse is a little more colorful, a little more illustrative, but To say that the kingdom of heaven is something different than the kingdom of God, I think is really, really hard in light of this verse. In fact, there's only one book of the Bible where the phrase kingdom of heaven ever even occurs. It's the book of Matthew 32 times. 
And it's just sort of Matthew's way of saying the kingdom of God. He calls it the kingdom of heaven. You know how John calls the kingdom of God? He calls it eternal life. You know, people, different authors have different ways of saying things, right? But it's the same truth. And Matthew doesn't make it, make it strict either because he does say the kingdom of God a couple of times. <laughs> but he prefers to call it the kingdom of heaven. Probably, scholars debate this, but probably out of sensitivity to the Jews, you know, you say heaven instead of God, like heaven forbid instead of God forbid, that sort of thing. Uh, but there are a couple of theories on that. All right, number five. Are you ready for number five? Dispensationalism interprets Old Testament prophecies literally, even when the New Testament does not. And this is a problem. I think generally literal is, is good. But look, if the New Testament is doing something with an Old Testament text, we believe the New Testament is inspired. We can't disagree with it. Be like, hey, you didn't interpret it literally. Like, who are we to stand over Scripture and <laughs> criticize it? Scripture criticizes us, not the other way around. So, in the New Testament, well, in the Old Testament, Jeremiah 31, the prophecy about the New Covenant. We're going to talk about this a lot later. But the prophecy about the New Covenant in Jeremiah 31, it says it's made with the house of Israel and Judah. So, did you know that classic dispensationalists said the New Covenant has nothing to do with Christianity, has nothing to do with the church. It's made with Israel and the house of Judah. Revised dispensationalism changed that a little bit. Revised dispensationalism, dispensationalism said, well, no, that applies to the church too. You know why? Because Jesus, on the, the Last Supper, said this, uh, he's talking about the wine, he says this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Jesus, Jesus offers the new covenant to his disciples. The church enters into that new covenant at the death of Christ. And Hebrews chapter 10 quotes Jeremiah 31 and says, this is already a reality for us. This is how we have forgiveness from sins. It is this new covenant. So revised dispensationalism said, all right, all right, all right. New covenant is for the church. Classic says, no, nah, it's just for Israel which is awkward, I think. Uh, Revised says, no, it's for the church too, but yet we want to interpret everything literally. There's a real tension there by saying, interpret everything literally except for this one thing over here because it's the new covenant and we have to follow the cue of Jesus. So that, I think, would be a problem with always interpreting it literally even when the New Testament shows us otherwise. All right, now... I want to read out a couple of things on progressive dispensationalism because progressive dispensationalism really changed a lot of these things I've been talking about. And progressive dispensationalism, for example, embraces the words of Christ, which was my, that's my big one, right? Uh, progressive dispensationalism recognizes the, the, uh, a lot more of the unity between Israel and the church rather than the um, differences between the two. Uh, but, there, as, as we'll see, there are, there are still differences. This is a quote from Craig Blazing. He writes, the plan, of dis the plan of redemption has different aspects to it. One dispensation may emphasize one aspect more than another. For example, the emphasis on divinely directed political affairs in the past dispensation and the emphasis on multi-ethnic spiritual identity in Christ in the present dispensation. But all these dispensations point to a future culmination in which God will both politically administer Israel and the Gentile nations and indwell all of them equally without ethnic distinctions by the Holy Spirit. So what he's saying there is that Israel gets the land of Israel in the coming kingdom, but the Gentiles get the other nations, and there's no real difference as far as Holy Spirit. Everyone is receiving the, whole, the same Holy Spirit. Everyone has got the same value before God. So there's a difference, but it's not a difference in quality. It's just a difference in territory in the age to come. And so uh, that, they are still retaining that within the progressive mindset, progressive dispensationalist mindset. Consequently, the dispensations progress by revealing different aspects of the final unified redemption. So they want to stress that there is still one hope. It's not two hopes. So progressive dispensationalism is moving along in that direction. However, as Stephen Wellam points out in Kingdom Through Covenant, the sine qua non, which means the essential, that with, 
that, that without not, um, without which not, sine qua non. Uh, the sine qua non of dispensationalism in all its varieties is the Israel church distinction. Furthermore, and related to this distinction, there is the dual conviction that, one, Israel as a national ethnic people still awaits outstanding promises that have not yet been fulfilled in Christ and the church, especially national and territorial promises, all of which has theological implications for eschatology. And two, God's relationship to the church differs in some significant ways from the dispensation with Israel, which has theological implications for soteriology, which is your doctrine of salvation, and ecclesiology, your doctrine of the church. So what I'm saying is you have classic dispensationalism, which is a little more hardcore, revised, which softens up off the edges a little bit. And then progressive dispensationalism is really kind of toned down from those <clears throat> earlier forms, but it still holds to a strong distinction between Israel and the church in the present and a very soft distinction between Israel and the church in the future. thought you might enjoy this little timeline. You start out with Darby, with classic dispensationalism, and that springs off into E.W. Bullinger in ultra-dispensationalism. And classic dispensationalism eventually... Um, has an offshoot of revised dispensationalism, and then out of that, we get this progressive dispensationalism. And you can see that the timeline there, starting out in the 1830s, and uh, they, they put progressive in the, in the 80s. Um, it's 80s or 90s, some people put the 70s. Uh, but <clears throat> what's, what's the point? The point is that I believe dispensationalism has some good, qualities to it. I listed off seven. But it also has some problems with it. I listed off five. And we are going to look at another system next called covenant theology, which basically views scripture almost exactly opposite as <laughs> dispensationalism. And then we're going to analyze that and look at what are the problems with covenant theology. And then finally, we're going to make our way to progressive covenantalism, which is a whole third system that we believe fits nicely in between dispensationalism and covenant theology in our future, future sessions together.